It's Kitty Gang Show on Scarbox Nation TV. It's the Kitty Gang Show on Scarbox Nation TV. And we're coming to you live from CB Giddy. It's the Giddy Gang Show. Giddy Gang Show. 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 It's the Giddy Gang Show on Cigar Box Nation TV. producer back there, Nick Lanciano, finished putting this one together this week. You can't see it, but to my right, the workbench is set up, and there are parts and bits on it. He's been filming the assembly of some of these kits in our tenor box line, uh, what we tentatively call this line, the tenor box kits where you build, you build the box, and we've got guitar scale and all that, you know, ukulele and banjo coming out all that good stuff so nick's been working on a how-to video for those things make sure nick's microphone is on here should he care to say something? hello something folks <laughs> so we are glad you are here with us today see the the comments started up before the show even did it's always good to see people getting in there grabbing a seat a virtual seat mm -hmm. if you will and we're glad to be here today been an interesting week up here in beautiful, uh, charming New Hampshire. Wicked hot, and then it cooled right down, and I don't know if it's even 60. It's 60 something out there, but it's not high 60s. It's just warm in here, I can tell yeah, you. It's that, good yeah. warm in here in the Juke Shack. Not, hey, there's Betsy Heron out there. Good to see you, Betsy. Hi, Betsy. Sue Messias, Keith Rerick, William Sneed, Lee Goff there, Ken Hope. Good to see you out there. Ma Giddy. They're in sunny northern Ohio. It's not so sunny here in New Hampshire. Hoping we get a little rain. So yeah, this is a four-string version of the banjo kit that we're working on. Uh, we hit a little bit of a snag lately with getting this rolled out in that it has gotten wicked hard to get this birch plywood in quantity like we've always been able to for years and years. Turns out there's all sorts of supply chain issues going on but just this morning just this morning they wheeled in 300 sheets of it oh. here at CBG. yeah really managed to track them down and uh so we're going to move forward with getting this banjo kit uh rolled out just as soon as i get the darn how-to guy <laughs> but yeah i got this one tuned to gdae my favorite uh, mandolin, octave mandolin tuning. We actually, I believe, sell this string set now. Yes, we do. <laughs> it's a mixture. 23-inch uh, scale. We got the, I got the strings picked out that work on there for playing. 
That sounds pretty good. Mandolin, octave mandolin, Irish tenor banjo all use this tuning. Sue saying she wants a banjo kit from Getty. Well, Sue, you've already built, you've already built some of these. That's basically a mini tambourine, six-inch tambourine set into the uh, soundboard there, and we figured out a way to do it. If you can see these screws here, a way to do it so that the tambourine head, the drum, really is suspended from the soundboard. It's not sitting on a uh, on other pieces inside there. It's suspended from that soundboard. And the goal for that, or the, the goal of that, is so that the whole thing can resonate out. And it does, by gosh. Tail piece, adjust, everything adjusts. So the four string version, of course the three string version's around here somewhere. There it is. Three string version, tune G, D, G. Now, the standard version of the kit's gonna come with uh, open G, G, D, G, B strings, which is kind of the standard for cigar box guitars. Probably tired of hearing that because it's in the intro. <laughs> tambourine banjos so uh all good things coming down the pike there mm -hmm. oh we've got some videos for you today our good buddy michael capato sent well he sent us a couple this particular one has to do with how to sand and polish giddy bucker covers the new metal giddy bucker covers that we got in recently and honestly Mr. Capato there gets some of the credit for us having them at all because it was pretty much him starting a conversation asking about uh, metal covers for these things that prompted me to, to get busy and, and find design and get some ordered and by God, now we've got them. So he'll show us his methods for sanding and polishing them. We've got an also awesome new video from our good buddy Brett Gardner down there in the Big Easy, New Orleans. Uh, it's a uh, one. It's him in four panels playing four different things on a couple of different instruments, including the special edition printed version of our hubcap howler kit that we sent down to him a while back. He put it together. It's a four-string version of that kit, and he's really making some awesome music on it. So we're going to take a look at that. We've got another one from our buddy Kale. Doing a song, what was it? Walls? Walls. Walls. I don't know. I don't I, know. It well, sounds great, but I could I don't know who it's out. from. Yeah. Was there another video as well? Oh uh, yeah, you're in a caboose. Oh, giddy in a caboose. <laughs> Alright. Well, you know, we always like to have some train themed stuff here on the Giddy Gang show. Danny's gonna be doing a song mm -hmm. that he wrote. About that oh, I didn't he, write this one. Oh. <laughs> that he did not write, but he's gonna <laughs> sing it. About that good old great big rolling railroad, the Union Pacific. Was it Woody Guthrie? No, that was written for the by the Union Pacific Railroad. By the it. Union Pacific, yeah. for the Union Pacific. Yep. So it'll be a very unbiased view <laughs> of their role <laughs> in America's railroads. Yeah, there's um, no uh, no BNSF sucks or, <laughs> or anything like that. Yes. Of course, uh, actually, I think it was before BNSF. Well, Nick, right, why don't we run this one? This will be a, a part of our how-to segment for this week's show. This video on the sanding and polishing of Giddy Bucker covers sent in by our good buddy, Michael Capato. So the first step was to sand.
and each of these and I mounted them using the masking tape and super glue trick to a block of wood so I could move it and I started with 250 grit and I worked my way up through to 1500 grit sandpaper and what I did is I sanded in one direction one grit and then I rotated it and did the next direction and I kept doing it until I got to the 1500. So the brand of polish I used was called Blue Magic and I just got it at an auto parts store. I was looking for a different brand. I think it was called Flitz and they didn't have it, but this said that this is very similar in that it can polish fiberglass, aluminum, plastic, and stainless and all the different metals, which is the same thing recommended for Flitz. So I just loaded it up on the polishing disc and I just started buffing away and I have had no experience in this in the past. So I just kept doing it until it got shiny. And as you can see, there's definitely a, a big difference between the shiny and the natural side. And it just got better with each pass. And now I'm doing the second one. And honestly, I can't recall which was the aluminum and which was the stainless on here. But they both take polish fine. So then I switched to a felt pad and I just went over it a few more times, basically just to get the excess polish off more than anything or get some of the excess polish in. So I just wiped off the excess with a towel and you can see it's noticeable. They're both shinier. So here's the uh, befores and afters of polishing the pieces. So this is the, um, I'm assuming the thinner one's the aluminum. So this is how it was when I um, unboxed them. Actually, I did try to hand polish these two. So they actually may, are a bit shinier. And I tried some other things before getting the uh, metal polish. And then this is um, after polishing. And you can see it's definitely, uh, I don't know how I, the camera, but it's definitely more shiny. And then this is the heavier metal, which I'm assuming is the stainless. And again, this is how it was. And this is how it is. And I'm going to admit, I've never metal polished before. And I've never especially done it with um, the Dremel attachment like this. So I probably could do a better job. And some of you may even be able to get a fully mirrored finish with it. But um, practice makes perfect. I think the biggest tip was sanding these, starting at the lowest grit, um, uh, 250, and working my way up to 1500 with to wet dry sandpaper, and going in the opposite direction, starting one way, then rotating it and, and going the other. So this is it. This is the guitar that inspired the uh, asking about these Giddy Bucker covers. You can see it's got a lot of nice shiny metal. Now the technique very quickly is called acrylic flow painting. And I'm gonna do a separate video on this. I actually shot a lot of the footage with this guitar, but some of it was corrupted. So I'm gonna to have to do another one. Um, it's gonna be a while because it literally takes like a month for this treatment to cure and be done. It's not hydro dipping. What you do is you take cheap dollar store acrylic paint and you put each color into a separate container and you mix in white glue or Mod Podge or acrylic matte medium or gloss medium and you mix each one in and mix it together. Then you take a red Solo cup and you pour each, each color into the cup and sort of what pattern you think or what the, you, you want to do. Then you take like a coffee stir and you stir it. And you can also add something like silicone spray or olive oil or baby oil, or they even show on YouTube using like sex lube and add a few drops and stir that in, and that'll cause the patterns sometimes to form random dots. Then you take your main cup, you dump it over, you swirl it around, and you let the paint flow. And I did it in a big Rubbermaid container that I could cover. 
so that I could do the top and the bottom box so it went down the sides and that I could do the fretboard. And you just let that paint flow slowly over over the period of a couple of weeks in that container and eventually it'll stop flowing and then it cures. Like I said, it can take like a month or more for it to finally dry and you have this rock hard finish and doing it over a base coat and it's totally random and organic, especially if you have, like on the bottom, if you have the uh, oil where it causes it to move the pink colors. And I will do a separate video. I'm gonna do another box of this very shortly. So that's it, Ben. Uh, I just, again, thank you for these covers. This guitar is gonna be fantastic when I finish setting it up. Um, I went with the aluminum, the thinner for this. I could have used either, but I think I did a better polishing job on this one. I'm sure with more patience and more practice, they both would have been mere shiny, but this is perfect. So that's it. And um, happy building with the Giddy Buckers and these new, really awesome metal covers. Thank you again, Michael, for sharing that with us. I know myself included, uh, how to get a metal part polished to a mirror shine is not something everyone knows. I know I didn't, but now I got a much better idea of how to do it, so that's a good thing. So here's a, speaking of train songs, here's a quick one that I learned from Johnny Cash. I know he didn't. I don't believe he wrote it. I'm not sure who did write it. If you know who wrote it, why don't you tell us in the comments? I'm going to be going on that big train trip now in about 13 days. And I can honestly say I don't want no aggravation when my train has left the station. <laughs> I don't want no aggravation when my train has left the station. If you're there or not. I may not even know Well, have a round and remember things we did that weren't so tender Let the train blow the whistle when it goes On my old guitar sell tickets So someone can finally pick it Tell the girls down at the Ritz I said hello I will see them in the fire Let the train blow the whistle with go Let her blow Say let her blow They're long and loud and hard and happy Let her blow Well, no regrets All my debts will be paid when I get late Let her blow Jimbo, you almost made me crack up when I'm trying to sing a song. 
I couldn't you comment because the... everything that came out probably wouldn't have been <laughs> show you friendly. And your, your gal pal rutabaga. I'm not Always sure. Oh, kept the bottom on the ground. I and heard. Tom Schaefer's over there rubbing somebody's rhubarb. Boy, this show's just going right into. <laughs> it went right, right into down the, the rhubarb. Right yep. down the rhubarb hole. Oh, so, you had to add a hole. Hey, just trying to be sociable. All right, so a couple of things. Um, I don't know if you've if I've showed this off before or even if Shane did, um, but as you may know, we have a two by four lap steel kit here at CB Giddy. I've heard it's pretty awesome. I've heard so too, and I'm about to prove it because I have one of the first original prototypes for that kit that Shane built. Now, you may know if you've been following Shane for a while and, and uh, he might jump on there today. The allergies have had him a little wound down lately, but uh, um, he likes to decorate things in interesting ways. So this particular lap steel here, I don't know how well you can see. Maybe Nick can zoom it oh, in. Oh yeah, let me give you a zoom there, guy. He went with the beer cap theme, and he's got beer bottle caps all along both zoom. sides. See, there's side one side, there's the other side with those beer bottle caps. He's got them uh, on the primary fret position fret positions there and then the the hold down he's got up here uh, above the nut to keep the string brake angle down is an old bottle opener uh, nice big threaded rod for the bridge there you know really interesting oh and the paste de resistance up here on the headstock there's a medallion from an old factory in York Pennsylvania where he lives so I have this tuned to an open uh, open D, actually, only because, oh, please, only because that was the closest thing to what it already was. So it's just six strings. I believe it's one of our lap steel string sets. I'm not much of a lap steel player. This 2x4 is probably worth about $150,000 right now. <laughs> <laughs> Did he sign it? To... Huh? Did he sign it? Did he? He usually does. Nope. Nope. It's only worth $120,000. Nope. This was a, a prototype. He didn't sign. But uh, it's a 2x4. You know, they're not designed with tone in mind. But of course, this dual rail humbucker pickup that we've got in here, which I believe is the same one that comes with the lap steel kit. Uh, that pretty much takes all the guesswork out of good sound because when you've got a magnetic pickup, especially one that isn't particularly microphonic, it's really just reacting and responding to these strings. You know, it, it's not worried about the acoustic resonance of, of the 2x4, it's just getting the strings. So you could theoretically mount this pickup and these strings to uh, a floorboard or a, a, a cinder block or a metal pipe or, or any number of things, a, a hunk of strong styrofoam, you know, <laughs> and it would pick up similar sound. Jim Burke saying they are fun to make, they are. And of course, a lot of people, if you follow the CB Giddy, Friends of CB Giddy page and our customer gallery on cbgiddy.com, you know that some folks have really, uh, gotten creative with these because lap steels don't have to have six strings they can have four they can have six eight twelve you can go hog wild and use fancy hardwood lumber all sorts of good stuff it might be hard to put a hog on a on a lap steel <laughs> do what might be hard to put a hog on a lap steel a hog you said hog wild never mind uh -huh. <laughs> 
Clancy on over, but <laughs> I never claim to be funny. Just funny looking. Hey, no. that's what hey, I tell my wife. Hey, hey. All right, well, we've got another video for you now. Let's run our good buddy Kale. We're going to save Brett, Brent, Brett, sorry, Brett till the end and uh, see what Kale's got for us. I'm going to turn the volume up so we can hear it too. A song called Walls. Howdy, folks. Happy Sunday morning. You know, a couple weeks ago, I was asked to come on the Giddy Gang Show, which is a weekly live stream they do on YouTube. It's a live variety show, and they do, they really focus on like cigar box guitars and other homemade musical instruments. They asked me to come on and do an interview and play a couple songs, which was really cool because I've never done anything like that before. But uh, maybe some of you saw it, maybe some of you didn't, but I'll go ahead and link it in the description and, in case you're curious. But here's the thing, I got a couple questions about one of the songs that I did. And so I figured I'd just do it for Sunday morning this week. Um, and it's a Tom Petty tune called Walls. And uh, sound a little something like this. he got into that we recognized it good old tom petty song there thank you for sending that in kale and a little, talking about it a little bit i think my tuning has shifted so danny's gonna do a song about the good old union pacific railroad which is i think one of the oldest originally named railroads still yeah operating in the country yeah really yeah the, pretty much all the others have been merged or merged and remerged and demerged Yep. Um, so I'd like to say hello while you're verifying everything is tuned up. Oh yeah. Say hello to Marcel Aspers out there. Good to see you, buddy. I already mentioned Jimbo. We got Rusty Taylor, Mike Wilmoth out there. Made it for the show. We're glad to see you. Welcome, welcome all. This is a good. Uh, this is a good one to tap your toes along to here. So I hope you're ready. I'm gonna be playing this new four-string GDA E-tuned. Uh, I haven't figured out quite yet what to call it, this here banjo. But we will, don't worry. Oh, and this is not a new hairdo. I just forgot to wear my hat today. Danny does have a new hairdo. He's yep, rather shorn. All right, this thing is your song. We're a great big rolling railroad one that everybody knows. We were born of gold and silver spikes a hundred years ago. We're a million miles of history shining in the sun. 
<laughs> We're Union Pacific and our story's just begun. From the great plains of Nebraska to the California Sea. Summit of the Rockies to the mighty redwood trees. We're a thousand wheels of freight train here. The diesel engine's power. We're the Union Pacific doing 90 miles an hour. Bound from Omaha to Portland through Cheyenne to Laramie. We're headed west from Boise, from the main line down to the sea. Uh, I'm not doing it today. Cross Flat Salt Lake City, on to Vegas and LA. We're the Union Pacific and we've got the right of way. From the green fields on the prairie to the blue Pacific shore, we deliver your great cargo and come rolling home for more. On the backbone of our nation, you can see us make the climb. We're the Union Pacific and we're gonna be on time. From the green fields of the prairie to the blue Pacific shore, we deliver your great cargo and come rolling home for more. On the backbone of our nation, you can see us make the climb. We're Union Pacific, and we're gonna be on time. All right, it's been a while since I've done that one. You can probably that's tell. A good one. I like that. That tune has been used in some other. Oh yeah. Other things, I believe, and that's all right. So here we are, halfway through our, our jolly show time, and we're glad you're with us. Marty Tauber out there hanging with us, William Franks, getting gang watching in Warren again. We're glad you're here. Um, so another thing I wanted to talk about, you know, lap steels and interesting decorations. If you if you followed Shane's various builds. Some of which he documented in his his mini book, um, Naked Poor Man's Making Poor Man's Guitars. No, that's his real book. Oh, it's a little book. Oh, the uh, Parts Caster book that, oh. that we publish here at CB Giddy. Uh, in those builds, he has done some interesting decoration. He always likes finding found objects, artistic objects like that, and basically bolting them on to his builds to create a really interesting look so speaking of interesting looks i have here next to me a stack of things which some of you might recognize last week i talked about using the all wood vintage cigar boxes the thin cedar cigar boxes well that got me thinking about the other type of vintage cigar boxes which are of course the paper covered cardboard ones we have here an old dusty Classic red Swisher Sweets, probably from the probably from the 60s. Then an old Senate Club, maybe a little bit earlier. You can kind of tell by looking at the back. And if they've got a tax stamp on them, that's probably from the 50s. An old La Rosa, Proza, Garcia and Vega, an old Flor de Melba, and then of course on the bottom here, one of the classics, a White Owl. Now, these old boxes, as you can see, often present some challenges to effectively turn them into instruments. Not forgetting. Well, hey, a challenge is still a challenge, no matter who's doing oh, it. I know. But I'm knowing, just trying to talk you out. Knowing, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> knowing how to approach and overcome those challenges, of course, is the heart or the the uh, important part, um, because as we all know, everything's easier once you know how to do it. Right? So, these boxes range widely in what they're actually made some. On some of them, there is actual wood underneath the paper. In fact, I think this white owl, this top, what is effectively the top of the box, that's wood under the paper. So that's not cardboard. That's a good thing. Even though this box lid is a t detached from the box, that's not a problem. That doesn't scare us. The lid being wood, plywood of some sort. Now the bottom, that's that's covered. You see the dust flying off. Um, this bottom, it has a wood grain on the back, but that's just a sticker. So this is cardboard. The sides seem like, oh, that's interesting. These two sides, the long side panels, are wood. The 
end panels are cardboard, believe it or not. So this box has a wood top, wood long sides, cardboard short sides, and a cardboard bottom. I wonder if it's how they package them, because the wood would hold... Sh well, no. I don't know. Like, both pa I don't know, that's weird. But... I'm still not scared, because what can you do? What I've done with cardboard, all cardboard boxes, like this Switcher Sweet box down here, there's no plywood involved in the making of that. That is all cardboard, but it can still work. Is the Hobo Fiddle, Switcher Sweet Hobo Fiddle, no, it's out on the shelf outside. Yeah. Anyway, you can still use these all cardboard vintage boxes to make little instruments. Now, you're not going to make you're not easily going to make a six-string Telecaster clone out of one. But with gluing in, I use hot glue, gluing in bracing in there to basically build up this box. Uh, and then you can also use that to mount the lid on. And if you do a neck through build, where the neck extends all the way through this box and the tailpiece attaches to that neck, then suddenly that neck is bearing most of the string tension, right? The box itself, you can't rely on the structural integrity of a cardboard box to stand up to really much string tension at all. Um, however, the bridge has to rest on the soundboard or the, the box lid, and you don't really want that resting directly on the neck through because that'll really dampen the resonance, right? So in this case, this white owl with the plywood top, you're pretty much good to go. Now you wouldn't probably make make it a four stringer, and if you did, you want to keep those string gauges really light. I tend towards nylon strings when using these cardboard boxes, just because I don't want to try to make them stand up to the tension and the pressure of steel strings or wound strings. Um, so with a plywood top, that should be able to stand up especially to nylon strings with a cardboard top such as this Swisher Sweets box has. Yeah, that is not cardboard. Or, I'm sorry, that is not plywood. It is definitely cardboard. Um, I wouldn't trust that to stand up. It's already bowed pretty badly on this particular box anyway. I would not trust that over time to stand up to the downward pressure of a bridge even with nylon strings running over it. So what can you do? Well, you could remove the top, replace it with a thin piece of plywood, but that kind of wouldn't be awesome because this, this design, is part of why you would use this box to begin with. Um, so what I might do on this is get a thin piece of 1 8 inch plywood and glue it onto the back of here, or remove this lid glue and clamp them so that that piece of plywood basically becomes the real structural support for that lid. And then I put it back on. It might stick up a little then, but that's all right. You can use a marker around the edge, something like that. Or you could just glue a brace piece under where the bridge will go, and that would give it some support too. So there are ways to make use of uh, otherwise what would kind of be unusable cardboard cigar boxes. I know when we get cigar boxes in bulk here at CB Giddy, we get pallets at a time of them, and I don't get any selection over what they send us. Sometimes they will send us a depressingly large number of cardboard crap boxes, basically, and, and we end up giving most of those away. But with these old, these vintage boxes, you can usually find at least a couple in any antique store. Because um, they made a lot of them, especially into the 40s and 50s, the mass production of machine-made cigars, the Swishers and the, the Dutch Masters and the Roy Tans and all of those, they made a lot of these boxes. And there are still a lot of them around. So, oh, Sue says, plywood, Xerox the top, glue it onto the plywood with photo mount works great. See? Smart people doing smart things. I like it. <laughs> helps us stupid people. Out. Helps, us, <laughs> helps, helps us dummies muddle along. All right, so now uh, we're going to do a quick video of me on a caboose. I suspect this is in Ohio at the Mad River Railroad Museum in Bellevue where I've been able to tromp around a little bit over the years. Do you know what song it is? 
It just says Caboose Song. Caboose Song. All right, well, here you go. Don't want no aggravation when the train has left the station. If you're there or not, you may not even know. Have a round and remember things we did that weren't so tender. Let the train blow the whistle when I go. On my old guitar sale tickets, so someone can finally pick it. sounded familiar to you there's a reason for that uh, but yeah there, there's something something about a song sung on an old train car that get, steps it up a notch or two and Nick said that Kale over on YouTube was commenting on the natural reverb that you get in a space like that if you've ever been in an old caboose you know not a re that wasn't one of the really really old ones probably from the 40s or so uh, all steel inside there, and it has that raised cupola, 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 cupola yeah. that yeah. you climb up into, and, and the old, you know, the train crew, the conductor and the brakeman and whatnot, would climb up there so they could see, because it's that cupola is above the level, well, it was above the level of freight cars back in the 50s. Now they got those extra high box cars and things that. Wouldn't work so good, but they'd climb up there so they could see the length of the train, see if there was any trouble coming. So that's where I was there in that video. I climbed up there, and it was nice and echoey, and yeah, buddy. So there's another round of uh, Let the Train Blow the Whistle When I Go for you. Still one of my favorite songs. Uh, so without further ado now, I teased you earlier. We've got this video from our buddy Brett Gardner down in New Orleans who hopefully I'm going to be seeing in a couple of weeks here as I roll through on the Amtrak. Going to stay several nights in New Orleans and see Amzie Adams and hopefully hook up with Brett there and, and hear some good music. Uh, Rusty asked if I'm going to be going through Atlanta. Actually, I will on the Crescent that runs from New Orleans up to New York City. Probably not at an opportune time for a visit and the stops are never very long even in a big city like Atlanta probably would only be about 20 minutes but yes I will be rolling through Atlanta and all, all sorts of points in the southeast southeastern United States there so anyway without further ado here's Brett playing an old uh, song from the 20s I believe an old foxtrot tune of some sort called what was it stumbling 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 foxtrot something like that so here you go <laughs>
that doesn't get a big yeah buddy i don't know what would that's awesome awesome playing on the three different instruments there and awesome editing too brett man you're getting good at that that is good stuff i love the sound of the ukulele and then of course that hubcap howler uh, that he built from one of our kits the four string version I could hear in places the, the tone of that spun paint can lid resonator cone there kind of coming through. So awesome, awesome work. Can't wait till uh, I'm able to meet up with you down there in New Orleans. So I think during that, Mr. Woodman over here figured out he's got another song he could do. What, yeah. What are, you, what are you leaning towards there, uh, Danny? Old Tom Petty one. All right. Or the tale that a Tom Petty one. And I just re it. released this one on YouTube, actually. Oh, so. yeah, that's right. Yeah. Back down. It's pretty basic. I think I've done it on the show before. I don't remember what I've done, but I haven't, haven't done, so if you've heard it before, quietly. <laughs> Very quietly on this, so I don't drown you out. All right. Well, I want back down. No, I want back down. enough to an hour for this week's fo this week folks so thank you again for joining us we will be back at you next week and hopefully we'll remember to pre-schedule the broadcast on facebook so that mr jimbo bird doesn't have to send me a message on friday morning saying hey is there a show today <laughs> so yeah we'll, we'll try to get back and, and do better at that speaking of getting back to things one more little side note this past sunday was Danny's first time uh, coming back to the Irish session down at pub in Dover, New Hampshire mm -hmm. in since the beginning, March of 15, uh, 15 months. Felt like 15 years. And what a session it was. Connor Makem was back too, and by God, we had yeah, 15, Pat. 15 plus musicians all, all going to town. Good, good stuff being able to get back to making music together in public. It's a wonderful thing, I think. Yeah, it is a wonderful thing. All right, let me quickly tune this here, Banjo, with the tuner that I uh, conveniently stuck oh. on that guitar. <laughs> so this is the three-string version of the banjo. And there's nothing.
nothing better for live uh, live TV than listening to a banjo being tuned. I've always said that. I've been wrong a lot too. This is my. <laughs> It's one of my favorite things of watching Green Heron's uh, broadcast is how much banjo tuning goes on during one <laughs> It's, a, it's a, an exercise in futility. Um, trying to get these things to stay in tune for more than five minutes. All right, then. This is the Giddy Gang Show, and so we're going to leave you today with the Giddy Gang Show theme song, which if you got a some sort of instrument handy you can play along with. It starts in the key of G, and we go to a C chord, and a G chord, and a D chord, and back to G, pretty much over and over. Every Friday afternoon at 3